edition, PhotoCamp Live. I'm Andrew Brennan, an education fellow here at National Geographic and your host every Friday for the next eight weeks as we embark on a learning adventure together. The National Geographic Society uses the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. And let's face it, the future facing us as young people in this world has never been more uncertain. Life during COVID-19 has revealed how deeply connected we are as a global community. In the heartbreaking deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, David McAtee, and George Floyd have underscored the history of violence and racism and injustice in the US, sparking an international movement. Recent events related to the pandemic, as well as Black Lives Matter protests in the US and abroad, have led many to take this time to show solidarity with their community and with humanity, to connect and to care for one another. But most importantly, young people, are mobilizing and speaking up for change. In this very moment, young people across the world are leading marches in the streets, insisting on the humanity of black lives and on the eradication of white supremacy. That's why we're here. Historian Studs Terkel once said, the act of telling one's story is an act that enlarges democracy. At the National Geographic Society, we are proud to support young people as powerful forces for meaningful change. We believe that young people are key to addressing some of the world's most pressing problems. You are part of a generation of leaders, storytellers, researchers, and organizers who are seeking solutions to help protect people and our planet. Your stories are important, and we want to hear your perspectives on life, and your world during this unprecedented moment in history. This week, we are joined by Asha Stewart and Erica Larson, two National Geographic explorers and photographers who have captured the stories of protests all over the world. It's fitting that we hear about their work today on Juneteenth, an annual holiday that commemorates the end of slavery in the US. It's considered to be the country's second Independence Day and it's a time for us all to celebrate freedom. So for those who are new, the idea behind PhotoCamp is to provide creative, passionate young people like yourselves with the skills to use photography to tell stories about your lives, as well as the movements, organizations, and inventions you and your peers are driving internationally. Through Explorer Classroom Special Edition PhotoCamp Live, we will explore the challenges and triumphs of our personal journeys and consider concepts like how can photography be used to cultivate empathy, understanding and connection with others? And what does it look like to overcome conflict, adversity and injustice? Here's how it'll work. Each week, I will be joined by two National Geographic explorers who work in different corners of the planet. Each explorer will share a little bit about their work and the trade secrets they learned along the way. During each session, you will have the opportunity to ask questions directly with these photographers, so come prepared. Each week, we will announce a photo assignment that you will be able to take part in. You can also share about your experience using hashtag PhotoCampLive on Instagram. You're also invited to submit up to three photos taken during your assignment for a National Geographic photographer to review and potentially have your work featured in our next broadcast. You can find the link to the submission form in the chat, YouTube description, or at natgeoed.org slash explore classroom. Now I know that some of you are thinking that your photography skills are not high level enough to get feedback from some of the best in the biz. To that I say nonsense. I'm no expert either, but I will be learning right alongside you week after week and together, we will tell powerful, compelling stories about our communities. You see, not only do young people notice things that adults sometimes might miss, but our peers are on the front lines of transformative movements all around the world. And that's why it's so important that we have the skills and the tools to tell our own stories. So I hope that you'll join me right here 
every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And if you miss a week, don't worry, this session will be available on our YouTube page. So without further ado, let me hand things off to this week's amazing guests to introduce themselves, starting with Asha Stewart. Hello students, I'm Asha. I'm a documentary photographer and filmmaker and my work typically focuses on sociocultural themes. My passion for storytelling has taken me across the world, documenting the Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh to women's issues in South Africa. And I'm very excited today to share my work with you all. Hi, Asha. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Erica Larson. Nice to meet you all. And I just want to quickly start by saying Asha and I have had uh, the opportunity to work with each other in a year long mentorship program. And that's one of the amazing things that photography can do to bring people together. Um, but I'm a storyteller who primarily uses the camera as a way to um, connect to the world. My main interest is how we relate to the natural world and how we use the camera in that form to help us communicate about that relationship. And ultimately, um, I use it as a tool to um, enhance my curiosity. And at the end of the day, it's really about expressing um, what it means to be human in this world. So um, we'll get back to me in a minute, but let's turn it over to Asha. Okay, so as a photographer and filmmaker, my story interests are rooted in the lives of people living in marginalized communities. One second, there we go. Um, so typically some of the subjects that I tend to photograph are people who are oftentimes forgotten about and people who don't get much media attention. So recently, I've been documenting what's happening on the streets of the United States with the Black Lives Matter protest movement. Now, Black Lives Matter is an organized movement dedicated to nonviolent civil protests to alleged incidents of police brutality against African American people. With the recent killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, there has been a historical new wave of civil rights movement that is currently happening now. As a photographer, I knew I had to grab my camera and go out into the streets because I wanted to be a part of this modern day history. I wanted to just be out there and be able to document this moment. The Black Lives Matter movement is different than previous protests because this isn't just in the US, it's going to Syria, to Australia, to England, to Syria. So the fight for racial inequality has gone all over the world. But in order to give you guys a deeper sense of what's happening in this historical time, I want to visually teleport you all to a neighborhood where some of these images, um, some of these protest images were, were taking place just down the street to a neighborhood called the Bluffs. Now the Bluffs is considered one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the United States and has been underfunded and underdeveloped since its creation during the Jim Crow era. The Jim Crow era was a period in time when black people couldn't drink from the same water fountain as white people attend the same schools or get fair or equal work opportunities. But today these communities like the Bluffs are still all over America. So through the lens of poverty, gender, sexuality, and racial inequality, I did a photography essay that shines a light on people who are impacted by our healthcare system when it comes to HIV and AIDS. For the story, I wanted to find characters who may not get the most media attention. So I documented people like uh, the homeless youth of Atlanta, black women and gay black men. 
The scale of the HIV crisis in the city of Atlanta mirrors that of African nations like Zimbabwe and South Africa. In the midst of this health, public health crisis though, I found hope. Now, one of the themes of this week's class is connection. And when I look at connection, I see the storyline of resilience. And here in this story, I found that in the Black community with leaders who are stepping up to help eradicate and address this HIV crisis that's happening in the Bluffs neighborhood in Atlanta. Now, I wanna show you guys a quick video clip of a behind the scenes look into me working on this story in, in Atlanta. Great. And so now on June 19th, 2020, we have Juneteenth. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but on June 19th, 1865, enslaved African Americans in Galveston, Texas were told that they were free. Now, 155 years later, people in cities and towns across the U.S. are still protesting marching and fighting for equal rights in America. With over 100 years of oppression, overcoming the KKK, Jim Crow laws, the systematic racist structures in America, Black people are still showing signs of resilience. As a photographer and as a human being who is Black and currently, like everybody else, going through the pandemic, tough times, but being able to create this body of work that I'm doing and being able to see the themes of hope and resilience, I feel inspired by what's happening. Having the opportunity to witness and to document and capture this new historical period has pushed me to think about the past and the future and what holds for our nation. So I hope that each of you in your own way feel encouraged to get involved and be a part of this new historical moment, even from the comfort of your home. So that's all I have. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Asha. Asha, do you, turn your, do you mind to turn your microphone on? I wanna ask you a question. Hey. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, so also from the presentation you just gave, you spoke a lot about resilience, but also just from knowing you, I know that that's a big theme in your work. Would you mind to talk to me a little bit about what resilience means to you, but also through your practice as a photographer, how has this, how has resilience changed you or informed you um, about what path you're going to continue on in your own work? Yeah, I mean, I think as a storyteller that is a woman and Black, I face discrimination and racism almost every month. Whether people think that I'm good enough to, you know, have a, be a cameraman or, you know, good enough to go out and create some of these images. 
Um, I think that through the subjects that the subject matter that I'm that I work on and the people that I meet, their courage and their resilience um, seeps into me unconsciously and consciously. And so I think like each story that I go to, I take these people that I meet with me. It's like they never really truly leave me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, then I'm going to go ahead, everyone, and share my screen. And um, give me a moment here. And get into my presentation briefly. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, as Asha mentioned, our theme for this week is connection. So we're actually going to give out an assignment at the end of this focused on this theme. So I just want to start um, by putting this word into your head, have you think about it over the next sort of 40 minutes that we're together, but what is connection? And um, so this is from, um, you know, in English uh, and from the dictionary, um, Merriam-Webster dictionary, the term for connection, meaning the state of being related to someone or something else, a relationship in which a person, thing, or idea is linked or associated with something else. So let's just keep that in mind. Um, and for me, I'm going to start with this because this was the first image for me, which um, made me realize that I was going to be a photographer and I didn't even know what that meant. Um, but I remember my father gave me this image in the form of a, a physical photograph. And I remember holding it and saying to myself, oh my goodness, I feel so connected to, to this planet, to Saturn. It's something that, you know, in theory, I knew was so far away with, so far away from me, but I felt like it was a part of me and that I was connected to it. And so therefore I associated the camera with a way to connect me to things that were far away, but at the same time directly impacted me. And um, this is me when I was young, I don't know, maybe five years old. And I put this in here, not just to show you myself when I was five, but to show you how important the image is as a sense of identity. And for us, we use images to tell the world who we are. Right now, I'm showing you this image to show you a part of myself and my past. So images are really important and they're about connection. And strong, strongly enough, what we just saw from Asha's work, it's about identity and talking about where we come from, our culture, and how we want to be perceived and identified in the world. And so as a photographer, the first thing that I chose to do was to photograph my family and the things that I knew best. And why? One, because it was what was comfortable for me, but also because if you don't know about yourself and you don't know about your own history and your own culture, you know, you need those tools in your backpack to go out and inform others and when you go out as a storyteller into the world and sort of to relate into the world. So the strong foundation of where you come from and the people that make up the world around you are extremely important. So I encourage you to use the camera to, to, uh, um, to learn about your own culture and your own life and tell us about that and then bring that tool into the world and begin creating stories outwardly as well. And as I began working, so now I've been working as a photographer for over 20 years, and I've been working with National Geographic for about 10 years. And in my main themes are our relationship to the natural world. And so I moved to the Arctic about 10 years ago, and I lived there for four years because I was interested in a culture called the Sami people and how as reindeer herders, they related to their environment and who, what was their voice in terms of their specific landscape, which was the Arctic. And what I learned about them, I learned many things, but one of the most important things I learned was about with their relationship to this unique landscape, they actually had dress, a traditional dress that told us about who they are. And when they wore this dress, they were not only saying, they're not just dressing up, they're saying, this is who I am. This is how I relate to my family, to my culture, what it means to be Sami and how I express the landscape around me. So how we dress, all of these outward things, they, you might think outward, but they're not. They have many profound layers to express who we are on the inside. And then from that work, after about four years, I came back to the U.S. and I got the amazing opportunity to learn about the connection of Native Americans with the horse. And 
um, this was really important. I worked with over 20 different tribes and this connection, not at first I thought, okay, it's going to tell you a little bit about um, this relationship with this amazing animal, but it, be, it became this really profound look into what it meant to be Native American in the United States, connection to landscape, how they are perceived to the outside world, but more importantly, how they could tell about their own history and their own voice. And so for instance, here, Jones Benali talks about his relationship relationship um, with the white horse and how it relates to where he comes from and um, his tribe's relationship with the power of their own creation but the power of their specific landscape and how artwork not only is something we do artwork is a way for us the storytelling process is a way for us to express um, in kind of subtle ways who we are in the world but also it's a way to have our ancestors and our people before us speak through us and most importantly, I learned about daily life. And then it's through our daily life activities in our own home, in our own landscape, that are actually what keep us most rooted to who we are and most rooted to the kind of solid base of, of how we're going to enter in the world. So these daily life activities are extremely important. And from this work, um, I got asked by National Geographic um, to cover the, the protest uh, at Standing Rock. And for those that aren't familiar with it, Standing Rock is a reservation in the United States. And what happened was the Dakota Access Pipeline, it's an oil uh, pipeline that was being diverted from communities outside of the Standing Rock Reservation. Um, and it was being diverted to the Standing Rock Reservation. And, um, and then all of a sudden, um, the youth in that community said, this is wrong. Why are you diverting this oil pipeline under our ground where our water supply is? And so they, they began to speak out and it ended up becoming the largest indigenous gathering ever to date. And through the relationships that I had built um, during my three years working on this horse story in Native American culture, I was able to, to go to Standing Rock um, with a group called Red Warrior Camp. And um, this gathering became really important because there was a lot of frontline protests similar to what we are seeing with the Black Lives Matter protests that Asha just showed us. But I realized for myself that the way that I work as a photographer, um, although the frontline protests are really important, I need to work sort of behind the scenes and access those daily life moments in order for me to have um, more understanding and a more kind of solid connection with my way of communicating. So I ended up going to um, going to some homes on Standing Rock. And I met Sarah Jumping Eagle, who's a pediatrician on, in, on the reservation, who um, raises her, her children there. And I asked her why this, why this moment was important. And she said, because clean water and the access to water is human right. I would go into other parts of the camps that were built up on Standing Rock. I would talk to George, he's a noggin, he's from St. Paul Island. And I asked him what this moment meant for him. And he said, he's doing this one to support um, all indigenous people in, in, in their voice that they, they, they actually stand up for, um, for our environment and to have a healthy environment because we are not separate from nature. But more importantly, he brought the seal skin that him and his grandfather had worked on together. And that's his connection to his grandfather and his ancestors on his back with him as he's in these moments. And so I would go around over the, over the weeks there and I'd continue to visit back and create portraits. And also another thing I want to, to keep in mind when you go out and creating that it's portraits, these, um, these movements with so much um, energy and activity like what we're seeing in Asha's work, but also it's the silent moments. It's, the, it's our environment. It's these things that stand around us that think about those as well. So this is what I would just consider a landscape or a still life. But this, speak about, this speaks volumes, right? No dapple, no Dakota access pipeline. And also they've been trying to get rid of us since 1492. So these moments are just as powerful as the portrait and the, and the activities. And I'm gonna continue here. I'm gonna to get to the end of, of my work, but I'm gonna continue here um, just to bring in connections. One, these still lives. So these were all the, the people, all the communities that had come together in Standing Rock and, and how far out they had come from. 
And actually I found Sami people there. So people that I had been working with for four years. And so I would photograph them as well. So for me, these very personal connections that continue to come into my life through my own storytelling over these 20 years are really important. So I would photograph Sami people there. And then I actually got the opportunity to spend a few days with Black Lives Matter at, at Standing Rock. And they had come to, to, to show their support and solidarity with Native Lives Matter. And this is one of the co-founders, Patrice Cullors of, of Black Lives Matter. And a few years later, I would then get to meet her other, her colleague and the other co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Alicia Garza, through a project I did with National Geographic called Women of Impact women that um, have gone around with, uh, um, enhancing their voice, talking about the things that are most important to them. Obviously Black Lives Matter with Alicia Garza, Emma Gonzalez speaking out against gun reform um, as she was there at the Parkland shootings in Florida, Taranya Burke, um, the founder of the Me Too movement, Tara Hauska, Native American activist who I met at Standing Rock, but who also, um, is a lawyer and an activist with Honor the Earth. And I'm gonna end here because it's important to me. This is actually a self-portrait of myself. And I think it's really important that we constantly check in with ourselves and think about what we have learned, who we are, and what we connect with and what it means for us to be human, what it means for us to tell stories and what it means for us to learn. Oh, and there's Asha and I. <laughs> that was, I think, at the end or somewhere in between our year-long mentorship program. Um, but I had to put that in. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now um, and go back to Asha and I together. And, and um, we're going to start talking about our assignment and, and, and hearing from you. Wait, I do have a question for you. Okay. Um, and that picture was adorable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you uh, you put that in there. <laughs> um, so knowing you and knowing some of the work that you do, it seems like through your work, there's a similar narrative or common thread of you working with communities like the Somni people or you know the indigenous communities, whether in Peru or in America. I'm just curious to know, like, why do you choose human driven narratives? Well, honestly, because um, from a pretty young age, probably around six years old, um, I actually questioned myself what it meant to be human. Um, probably not that articulately, <laughs> but um, I, I really thought about I, I had a dream where I saw myself. And I thought, what is, I remember kind of waking, I was in my dream and I saw myself walking down my own hallway and then I saw myself lying in bed. And then I woke myself up and realized, whoa, wait a second. If I can see myself sleeping, what does that mean to be awake? And what does that mean to be human? And so I think from a really young age, my curiosity is always, is, has always lied there. Um, and not so much in this grand global theme of what does it mean to be human, but what does it mean for me to live my life? Um, and so my stories have always been driven by this curiosity to understand exactly that, our connections to our cycles of life and death, and then ultimately what it means um, to be a part of nature. Because I think so often we consider ourselves separate than nature, but we actually are nature. And so I seek out um, people and communities that can help me understand these connections better. Amazing, that's amazing. <laughs> So, okay, so together, I'm gonna start actually, and Asha, please chime in on this. So basically now, this is where we're kind of done talking. You, you can ask some questions, but what we're gonna open it up to is what your assignment's going to be. So I've said it a bunch of times now, it's about connection. And what we want you to think about is, what does connection mean to you? Um, why is it important? Why is connection even important? What are you connected to? And we want you to use your camera as a way to, to show us this, to teach us actually, 
to teach Asha and I and everyone else um, what connection means to you. And therefore, what, what are you probably going to do? You're going to show us something unique about yourself, something unique about your culture, your family, your friends, and um, those of you that want to go out into the streets a little bit further, teach us about your, your communities, and then maybe we can talk about, you know, just what it means to be connected to everything. So you have this opportunity through the camera to bring us um, into your world and help us learn. Um, uh, Asha, I don't know if you want to uh, contribute a bit to that, and then I, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the practical nature of things like that. But what are you thinking? Yeah, I think this is a very exciting opportunity for you to kind of record what's happening in your life during this pandemic or whether it be with the Black Lives Matter protests or just generally in your home. I think that right now it's important to just record and to make sure that this moment is a keepsake. So I'm excited to see what you guys come up with and to be able to look at your images with Erica and the rest of the Nat Geo team. So I should just let the cat out of the bag. So that's also the point of this is that if you submit your images and I'm going to give you the practical way of how to do that. But Asha and I are going to sit together, I think on Monday, maybe I think Monday, I think you have until Monday to do this. Um, but Asha and I are going to sit together and look at every single image that's, oh, awesome. I'm getting a note here. Monday until um, 5 p.m. Eastern time, New York City time, you have to submit your images. And Asha and I are going to sit together and look at every, well, virtually together, I should say, and look at every single image. Um, and then we're going to make a selection of 12 images that will then get shared with next week's photo camp. So if you tune into next week's photo camp, your, one, of, one of your images could possibly be there being shared with the, with the next week's group. Um, but so it's not as much as just getting yourself um, to, to pick up your camera, your iPhone or whatever you have, um, an iPad, whatever you have available. Um, but I want you to think a little bit about your captioning. And what does that mean? Um, so a caption is really something that's going to provide context and give another layer of importance to your image, right? Photography is a visual communication and that's amazing, but it's very helpful sometimes, especially if people aren't there with you to give one more layer of context. So it's really the who, what, where, when of your photograph. Um, and so you, I want you to think about that with the, the image that you turn in because you're going to, to write that down for us so that when we look at the images, we can put it into a context and then that will also be shared. Okay, but how are we going to do this? Where are you going to put your caption? Where are you going to put your image? Um, so there's two ways. First, there's going to be a submission form. It's going to be a Google Forms, I, I believe, if someone wants to chime in on the chat, just to make sure that I'm right with that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a Google Forms that is available on this YouTube link that you're all tuned into now, but also on notgeoed.org backslash Backs, backsplash, backslash Explorer Classroom. And that's natgeoed.org backslash Explorer Classroom. But again, you'll find this, that link also on here. And when you go to that link, you're going to find a Google form. You're going to up, you have the opportunity to upload three photographs that you've chosen. And in there, there'll be a form where you can put on your captions, the who, what, where, and when. If you don't feel like doing that, if you just want to go out and take some pictures, um, if you, you know, if you're, if you don't want to engage in that way, you have the opportunity, um, to just share it on our, uh, Instagram feed with the hashtag photo camp live or, uh, back, um, hashtag Gen Geo. And those, um, uh, hashtags can also be found on this YouTube link. So you don't necessarily have to write captions and turn them in. It would be amazing and we'd love it if you could relate um, and participate in that way. Uh, but there's various ways that, that you can have, have your voice put out there. Um, okay, so at this time, I think we turn it over to, to Andrew. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Erica and Asha um, for taking us on that journey. Asha, your challenge to us uh, to tell stories of struggle and resilience that are too often ignored by society and, and Erica, your passion for uh, depicting the connection between people and the planet, uh, both could not be more relevant in this moment. Um, I do want to open it up for question and answer 
portion of the event now. Um, if anyone watching has a question, please drop it in the YouTube comments um, and would we'll love to uh, have you answer it. But first we have some questions from uh, those young people joining us uh, on camera today. Uh, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to them first. Uh, Irina, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, in order to communicate through an image, that image needs to have like a strong idea captured. So how do you make sure that I capture an important thing and what I captured is gonna transmit the same idea that I saw in that picture? How do I make it important? Do you, you want me to take it, Asha? Or do you wanna? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. How, how does the image um, trans, you know, kind of transfer, translate what you're thinking? And um, my answer will be a little less technical. Um, I think this, I think first of all, it's most important um, that if you have sort of your heart, um, your mind, your soul into what you're doing, um, you start to form a connection with things around you. And those questions, honestly, just sort of present itself in, in the relationships um, that you're building with people and the relationships even with landscapes and, and things around you. So you're, as, as long as that question is really kind of in the, the profoundness of you, you find that that people kind of end up answering it in ways that um, as you ask it. And so I don't know if that really makes sense, but it has to do with your intention, right? You just kind of be like, ah, but if you're really passionate, if you're really interested, if you're really curious, then I think that these questions start to get answered. And, and on the other end of it, that's what's brilliant about storytelling and art in general is that you can have your intention, but at the end of the day, storytelling is not only, we're only one half of the story, right? The storyteller is only one half. The other half is the audience. And therefore that allows, the, um, with that kind of open-endedness, that allows the audience to come in and bring their mind, their heart, and they might not be taking away from the image what you intended, but they can reflect on it. And therefore it kind of, that, that image, that artwork, um, takes a life of its own so it's like it's like you kind of if you birth something with a great intention you can't you can't keep it its whole life you let it have wings and fly and let people relate to it um, but you know that you've put your heart and soul into it so that's the way I, I think. Asha did you want to respond to that question as well? I mean I think Erica pretty much summed it up perfectly um, I think sometimes it comes to you and you just have to be patient. Yeah, uh, and, and in some ways, Asha, your, your, uh, your work, how uh, some of the images that you shared were so powerful, um, but they depicted really kind of normal things that, that folks were doing in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and you know, I think that's something to keep in mind. As yeah. well. um, Nazis of everyday life can be um, very interesting, especially if it's like, a different community that you're not part of or you don't typically understand the nuances of their life and I think in America we live people think that we all live this like the same lifestyle but we don't um, there's two different Americas and I think that that's what I was trying to go for absolutely uh, Tudor did you want to go ahead and ask a question as well To you might be muted. I don't know. Well, Tudor, we can come back to you as soon as you figure out your mute situation. Just give me a signal. But in the meantime, um, there were a couple of questions in the YouTube chat that I wanted to um, go ahead and pose to you all. Uh, Jonah um, asks, how can we phot uh, photograph human connections uh, considering the current global pandemic? Asha, you want to take that one? Yeah, um, there's so many different ways that you can photograph um, from your own house or your 
or even yourself, you can take a self portrait of yourself. You can document, you know, your house during the pandemic times. You can document, you know, from your window. There's so many personal narratives that can, can be sparked at this moment in time due to the coronavirus. So I wouldn't look at it as a restriction, but I would look at it as an opportunity to be a part of history because we're all quarantining in our house right now. And that's a, we're living through a historical moment. I mean, the last time that anyone in the world went through this was in 1804 or around then. So it's, it's been a while or 1904, sorry. And something else just technically you can, you can think about is, um, right, let's use technology to the fullest. So I'm seeing a lot of work coming out of, you know, how you, if people were having this, you know, photograph YouTube, photograph your Zoom calls, um, use that as an opportunity. Like actually it's not about, okay, what do we not have, but what do we do have, right? So think about what tools you have and then how you can, um, you know, um, how you can utilize them in a new form is actually a time to get really creative. So for instance, let's say what you're seeing on the news, let's say you, you, would, you, you don't live in the US and you're interested in something that's going on here or vice versa. You don't live in Moldova and you'd like, you're interested in what's going on. So go into the news channel. You can actually photograph those pieces of the news channel and they're like, this moment is what's important to me. This is what, so you don't, you know, actually, I mean, a photograph in general is about the kind of, how should I say the mystical magic of light and time? It's it's not actually what's happening anyways, right? It's about how we creatively tap into light and time. So let's use technology as another tool for that. And also don't um, don't disregard that that a reflection of yourself right now isn't a reflection of of the whole. There's some every, we're we're all connected. Um, you know, to one part of this great collective story. So reflect on yourself and then ultimately um, that that allows others to learn about who you are and become something something more, so. Thank you so much, Erica. And, 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 and Nasha, I did just wanna ask you as well, as you're photographing these Black Lives Matter protests, um, what are you doing personally to stay safe and to stay healthy? Personally, I'm wearing a mask. So that's number one. I'm wearing a mask and I'm constantly moving, you know, in and out of spaces of large groups of people. So I'll go and I'll take some images and then, you know, I'll take a moment to sit back and kind of think about and feel the energy of what's happening, but also making sure that I'm not just like enclaved with, you know, thousands of people. Um, so I'm doing that, but I'm also making sure that after the protests, I'm not going around, you know, anyone in my family that could be vulnerable to coronavirus, just in case potentially I could contract it, but I don't, I don't think that I, I would, but, you know, just in case that's just a safety measure that I've been practicing. Awesome. Uh, we did get another question from Anjali uh, in the chat, and it's more of a technical question. Uh, Erica, maybe you could take this one first. Um, she's asking about what uh, equipment and settings you normally use uh, in order to capture uh, photographs with such uh, sharpness and detail. Um, okay, so thank you for the question. So sharp, yeah, there's a couple of questions. Um, let's see, how do I answer that? So I'm actually using, well, I, I wanna start by this, by saying, you know what, it really, the equipment is important, but it's, you know, you can nowadays, honestly, like the iPhones or the smartphones, whatever they're called, um, are amazing. So that's, I mean, it, it doesn't, I don't, don't think you need to go out and buy a really expensive camera to have that. It's more important how you are engaging with what you're doing, first of all. Um, but second of all, if you're asking me specifically what I'm using, so I use a range. So I actually, oddly enough, I use a lot of film, which I don't even think people think is that sharp or in focus. <laughs> but um, but I use a lot of I actually use a lot of old, old film cameras, and then I use some uh, DSLR digital cameras. I use a medium format digital camera, and depending on the situation, I'd be curious to know if Ash is doing this with some of the protests. Um, some situations that that I'm going into, I, I was covering some stuff in my community with COVID, and I just didn't want to linger too long in one place. Um, so I was using my smartphone to go and do that so that I could kind of take a picture and get out of there and not spend too much time. So although 
you know, it is important to think about what tool you're picking up. Absolutely. Um, I don't think they have a ton of limitations if you can at least get your hand on, on some kind of smartphone. Yeah, I typically use DSLRs. Um, they're typically affordable. I shoot with Fujifilm. And I think that for me, when it comes to sharpness and detail, I think a lot of times it comes down to specific lenses that you may want to use to get your the visual, um, whatever, whatever your visual goals are. And so I typically shoot with like a 35 millimeter or a 55 millimeter um, when I'm shooting portraits or just reportage style. So a lot of the images that were shown from the Black Lives Matter protests were shot on a 35 millimeter lens. So yeah. Awesome. It, 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 and it's, it's such a good reminder, uh, the power of just the smartphone in your hand, if you have one, uh, as, as, a, as a camera um, to capture the world around you. Um, we did have a question from Matt that maybe we could start with Asha this time on, um, he's asking about uh, capturing vulnerable people and wants to know uh, what is your approach uh, to asking permission um, uh, when you're photographing vulnerable people um, and also uh, uh, how do you make sure that you're respecting them as you're telling their story? Yeah, I think walking into a, uh, walking into a place with real intentions is the most important. Like you really have to care. And I think people can just feel that energy when you walk into a room. So I think being authentic and being really uh, honest about what you're working on and trying to create a moment where you're creating empathy, but you're also lis really listening, like truly listening to this person who is going through um, whatever trials and tribulations they're going to. So I think listening and then also maybe sharing something about yourself as well and building that connection, a real relationship with um, the person that you're trying to photograph. And I think through those two lanes, you can create trust. And by creating trust with them, you'll be able to uh, share their story and they'll be willing to you know, let you into their world. Yeah, and you know, um, Erica, you really have traveled the world to capture uh, folks in remote communities. Uh, you talked a little bit during your presentation about uh, moving to the Arctic uh, to, to live with the Sami people. Can you talk a little bit more about how you made that decision and what you were after uh, when you uh, uh, kind of uprooted your life in that way? Yeah, so I mean, at the core of it, um, the theme was always the same. I was interested to find people um, that could help me understand better um, how we could interpret our relationship to the natural world. And I was very interested in the Arctic, um, especially um, as we're seeing such great changes in the Arctic and how that's going to affect all other areas of the world. So I was interested in what people were or could represent that voice of the Arctic. Um, and then also on a really personal note, I was interested in finding a sense of silence. And that goes to Asha's question about listening. And the reason I wanted the sense of silence is I remember saying that I I've kind of need to learn how to listen again and learn how to hear again. And um, so I really actually committed to, to breaking down all the things that I thought and just being silent and listening. And within that, there comes the idea of then you can hear again, right? But I actually learned Sami language and that was really important um, so that I could actually rethink how to speak again in a different way and even learn how people, um, or try to understand how people interpret something through different languages and different cultural um, understandings. So that was, um, yeah, that was, that was how I, I decided to do that. But the one thing I, I and, and to the point is what Asha was also saying is that I think it's really important to remember to never ask anything of other people in this storytelling process that you're not willing to give of yourself. Um, and I think I always keep that in my, in my camera bag. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and Asha, you also have some experience um, kind of traveling to more remote places, in, in your case with the Sidi tribal people. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience? that experience and what you were hoping to capture um, when, when photographing them? Yeah. 
So the main reason why I went all the way across the world to India to live there was to understand what it's like to be black in India, in Asia, because uh, the Sidi community came to India about 500 years ago as slaves with the Dutch, Portuguese, and British. And they kind of made their own communities in India. And so when I went there, I kind of wanted to just understand how they've been able to maintain such a authentic culture in a land of over 1 billion people. How could they still keep this like tight knit community? And how are they also dealing with resilience when it comes to um, the global ideology of what it's like to be black? So when I went there, I was just trying to understand what the experience was like and it had a profound impact on me just to see the way that people live over there and to just understand how they've been able to blend into Indian society but still keep such an authentic nature of their own culture. That's super interesting. I mean, both of you really embrace the idea of connection across difference and, and, and connection in general, which is um, the, the theme of, of uh, today's episode. Um, I did just want to take a step back uh, for the young people that are watching um, and ask you both kind of what moment in your life you realized um, that you first wanted to become a photographer uh, and that this was something that you wanted to do uh, as a career for the rest of your life. Uh, I think there are a lot of people watching who might be about to have that moment or, or in the midst of having that moment and are maybe feeling a little confused. So um, Erica, if you wouldn't mind, I, I'd love it if you could share that with folks. Yeah, for me, I think age wise, when it became kind of, oh, this is it. I was probably around 15 um, when I said, okay, I this photography is something I really wanna do. But I think it takes a lifetime to understand what that really means. Um, and now looking back, I realize that um, it could be really helpful for, for you, you guys out there to think about this, that um, it, it's the photography is, is a tool you learn, but who you are and, and your approach to storytelling and, and your interests, those, those have always been with you. So it's not really a decision, right? It's just a decision. Those are like who you are, your, your relation, your expression to the world is already there. It's just now what tools you decide to use um, uh, to relate those out into the world. Yeah, and I think um, what Erica just said is dead on to how I kind of fell into photography. So um, I was a cultural anthropology student my sophomore year of college and I went to Haiti to do a, it was like an independent study. And I was there and I was like working on looking at the relationship between Haitian culture and African culture. And I was going into these different cultural um, celebrations and events and ceremonies. And I was basically people watching because that's what anthropology is. It's like you get into these spaces and you watch people and you analyze and you try to understand. And I realized, you know what? I don't really want to write a 30 page paper on this. Like what is a way that I can connect and really show people what I've experienced and what I've seen. And so I, you know, kind of just started taking pictures, started doing some video and then it just became an obsession. Like I just never put it down. And so here we are today. <laughs> I love that. And I, and I love the call out to the fellow peacher, people watchers of the world. Um, I am one myself. <laughs> um, I did just, okay, so we have another question from Emma um, asking, uh, how do you overcome any anxieties or awkwardness that you feel uh, when approaching uh, kind of random people uh, to photograph? Ash, I don't know if you wanted to start for that one. I think for me, like having the physical presence of a camera gives me like so much power, like maybe that I just don't typically have in a sense of like um, just being a little bit more outgoing. Cause it's like with the camera, it's like you're there, but you also, it gives you a reason to be there. So people are more like, like likely to let you in cause they're like, oh, this person's talking to me or they're here because of this physical camera. And, and when I'm behind the camera, I feel like I'm there, but I can also, it's a, I can also separate. So it's like, it's like two worlds coming into one almost. Um, Erica, what do you think? 
<laughs> I honestly, this is not going to be the answer anyone wants to hear, but I honestly have not figured it out. I get nervous every time I go out. I'm, and it's, and actually, I always say to myself, I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, didn't I just figure this out the last time? And then I realized, no, it's the same fear again. It's the same anxiety. And I haven't figured it out. I, I wish I had a better answer. All I can say is um, the thing that keeps me going is that, and I think it goes back to what's your intention? Like, I, I feel for me, it's like, this is something that I'm sort of, I need to learn about this. It's something that this is the way that I educate myself about what it means to be human and the way that I then, then pass that on my, my child. And so that, that drive is greater than my fear, but I have the fear every time. <laughs> so. And after 20 years of experience to still have that, it should, at, at least that should settle some of our uh, own nerves as well. Um, wow. So I did, okay, so I, uh, we have one more question that I, from the audience, and then I'm going to ask you both a question just to kind of end things on. But um, Tudor wants to know, uh, when it comes to portraits, if you have any advice on technical settings uh, that can help to create a, a powerful portrait. And Erica, maybe we could uh, talk with you on that one. Okay. Um, hi, Tudor. It's good to see you here. I worked with Tudor in Moldova, so um, he's amazing. So I'm glad you. I'm glad you're able to make it for this. It's really nice, and thank you for the question. Um, so portraits. Honestly, your your first tool is is you. It's your curiosity, it's your question, it's your genuine openness um, to having respect and interest in the other person. That's first. That being said, technically, um, I always think it, you know, I always think about things in terms of um, the environment that somebody's in, right? People's environment inform who they are. So think about where you're creating that portrait. If it's something that you can control, maybe it's asking the person, where do you feel comfortable? Where would you like to be portrayed? And I think that's really important because so often as the photographer, um, we think that we should put the person where it looks best, but maybe we should ask the person where they feel the most comfortable. And with that understanding of where do you want to be? Um, I think things relax a little bit and you get more exchange out of a person, um, a more genuine exchange together. And, um, and then also that can be uh, creating portraits in several ways, something close up. The close up is always very beautiful, cutting out the environment, not saying the environment where you are isn't important, it is, but you can, once they're in that environment, you can cut it out by creating something close and then you taking several step backs and showing that environment. And then one more layer technically for those that are a bit more advanced with cameras is to think about your aperture. So whether you want a lot of depth of field, whether you want everything in focus, or whether you want um, every, a, a background out of focus and the person in focus. And these two things say a lot about what you're trying to say. Is it about the person or is it about the person related to their background? And you do have control over this with the type of tool and camera you're using. Um, and the last thing is light. A camera, a, a photography is um, a language of light. Think about your light, think about your shadows, be aware of it. You are the magician with light. That is not, you know, people have light inside of them that they're going to show you, but it's up to you to see it and to, to capture it. And then also to balance that with the light that's around the ambient light. Yeah. And just to add to that, I think from a technical perspective, everyone has their own style they have their own voice like you should just go out and experiment with different vocal lengths experiment with different styles of portraiture and find like your own lane and your own voice like the worst thing you can do is try to be like someone else like you just should always always try to find your true authentic voice and just really go out and to you know keep shooting like really, you're only gonna get better too if you just keep shooting. So if I were you, I would experiment, experiment with you know people in your house who you're quarantining with. You know, take them different angles if they if they're if they want to participate. But yeah, just experiment and see what happens. You never know. Awesome, and just uh, we're nearing the end of uh, today's episode, and I just wanted to ask if 
Erica, you or, or Ashley, you have any last minute um, pieces of advice for folks as they embark on completing this week's assignment, uh, keeping in mind the theme of connection? Um, I think that, like we've said several times throughout uh, this presentation, that we're going through a historical moment and you guys should really make sure that, you know, you capture it. And I don't mean like going out to a protest, but I mean, just even in, within your own home, whether you have, you know, people around you wearing masks or you're inside your house quarantining, I think documenting this moment is something to not be missed. So I'm looking forward to seeing you, your guys' photographs. Erica? Um, and I would say that I think uh, it's most, it's, it's really, really beneficial to take a look deep inside yourself um, no, try to understand yourself, try to understand your own fears, um, and try to understand the things that you feel the strongest about, um, and the things that you don't understand at all. Look at those things first within yourself, and then I think that that just brings a much more open person, um, a, a much more open side of yourself when you go out in the world, and, and, and then try to have this uh, conversation or exchange with the camera. Awesome. Thank you both so much for imparting your words of wisdom uh, with us today and, and for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everyone watching for joining us. Um, remember to share about your experience using hashtag PhotoCampLive on Instagram or Twitter, uh, and to use the link in the description of this video to submit your assignments for next week. Uh, you can follow me at A.E. Brennan. Uh, on Twitter and Instagram, and you can follow National Geographic at Inside Nat Geo. Um, finally, this is important. Don't forget to public, uh, follow all public health guidelines uh, when you're completing your assignments. It's really important to stay safe uh, and to flatten the curve during this global pandemic. Um, I will see you all here, right here next week at 2 p.m. Eastern. And until next time, au revoir.